In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. As we come together, and especially during these days, as we celebrate the Apostles, currently in their fast and also in their feast. It's important for us to want to understand a little bit more. It's not enough for us to do things just for the sake of doing them. Because we're all too old for that. I think we need to understand why we do things. Why do we celebrate the apostles? What's the relevance of the apostles? Seeing the Apostles means we see their lives, we focus on their lives, we understand what they did. Not just as a history lesson, because that doesn't really mean very much. But we understand what they did because we want to know. So that we can live the same thing. See, the great thing about the Apostles is that they were like us. They were human, and they had all the human weaknesses. They were rash sometimes, like St. Peter. They doubted sometimes, like St. Thomas. They were aggressive sometimes, like St. James and St. John, uh, sons of Zebedee. They were lost sometimes and ran away, like St. John the Beloved. They all had very clear human perspectives and human characteristics. But what's important is that they were still able to live holy lives. They were still able to live holy lives. Holiness is something we are supposed to live, not just read about. It's important for us to live holiness because we are the ambassadors of Christ. And people see us and glorify God. They want to follow him because they see our example. We treat the apostles as these very big, important figures in the history of the church. But at the end of the day, there is something we all share. And that is that we are the children of God. We're his children. And he wants us and he seeks us. And he calls us to himself and he calls us to his kingdom. It's one thing for us to want to follow God's will. It's another thing to do it happily. It's another thing to actually want to follow it and enjoy following it. So often we look at God's will as a burden. When, when something goes wrong, we say, well, it's God's will. That's it, you know. If something goes wrong in your exam, if you don't get past an exam, if something happens, if you don't get what you want, if you don't end up in that relationship, if you don't, whatever it is, the first thing your parents will do to console you is say what? It's God's will. It's like God's will is only the bad stuff that happens to us. It's only the stuff we have to make excuses for. And so God's will end up, ends up being an excuse. But God's will is much more than that. God's will is in our life through everything. Absolutely everything. It's in the good. It's in what we think is the bad. It's in the successes. It's in the apparent failures. But it's in everything. And so we need to give thanks to God in everything. That's why today, before you started this meeting, you were praying the Akbeya. And the first prayer of the Akbeya is the prayer of thanksgiving. And in the prayer of thanksgiving, we say we thank you on every occasion, in every condition, and for all things. For everything. But it's important for us, if we want to follow God's will, 
to try to understand it. Not to have it just imposed on us, just forced on us, but something that actually becomes desirable. What we know is in this life we have lots of choices. And it's good for us to have choices. We choose what we want. We choose the way we want to do things. And what's also extremely important is that we have become so refined in our choices that you don't just put up with anything anymore. You go online, you get the website of whatever you want to buy, and you refine the details. You pick the color, the size, the interior, the exterior, you, cut, you, cut, you choose options, you look at different uh, specifications, and that's anything you buy. We've become very, very particular. We've become very particular what we want. And so, with God, we need to have two things that are very important. One is to be very particular, but the other is also to be thankful. We don't want to become materialistic. We don't want to become just consumers. We don't want to just be those ones who choose things based on what they want in a physical, material way. But things that also engage in what God wants of us and his life that we must live in this world. That's why in the first epistle of St. John, chapter 5, verse 21, St. John writes, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. What does that mean? What is an idol? How many of you have got statues at home that you kneel in front of and offer incense to? We don't have that, uh, that sort of idol anymore. We don't have that sort of challenge. What are the idols we have? The idols are very different. The idols we have are still material, they're still physical, but they're not false gods in the worship context, they're false gods in the worldly context. Some of the idols we worship, what are they? Things like, like money, like success, like fame, like celebrity, like possessions. Things like even our careers, our work. We even idolize people sometimes, whether they're celebrities we want to be like, or they're people we deal with. Relationships that become toxic. People who become destructive in our lives because we put them before God. And that is what worshipping idols is. It is worshipping something and putting it before God. So all of those things that I mentioned are fine. You should work and make money. You should have a career. You should have possessions. You should be in a relationship if that's how God has called you at the right time. All of these things are very good. But when we put them before God, then they're not. When they take the place of God, then they become destructive and they become bad for us. Our Lord warned us and said that we cannot serve two masters. We can't serve God and have God and yet at the same time serve the world and just have the world. There is always, as you know, an end and a means to an end. An end and a means to an end. Our end must always be God's kingdom. Our end must always be a life with God. And that's here and everlasting, not just everlasting, here and everlasting. That's what our end must be. 
That's what our goal must be in life. The means to the end is whatever then we do. If we work, it's a means to getting closer to God and witnessing. If we study, it's the same. If it's a relationship, it's the same. If we have a role, it's the same. If we do something in the world, it's the same. If we serve, it's the same. What happens, however, is quite the opposite. We often have goals that are of this world. We want to pass that exam. We want to get that job. We want to be in that relationship. We want to receive those things. But what happens, in actual fact, is quite the opposite. We want God to be a means to that end. We want God to fulfill those things for us. We want God just to provide. That's all. So the end becomes the world and everything in the world. The means to the end becomes God. So rather than following God and wanting God, we actually use God to get what we want. And that's a complete reversal of what it should be. That's a complete switch. It, it's a change. It means that, well, God becomes something in our lives that is only important when we want something else. And that's why what we'll find sometimes is we'll pray very hard when we want certain things. That we will pray very hard when we need something. Because God becomes a means to an end. As long as everything's fine, as long as the world is fine with us, we don't engage with Him very much. As long as the world is fine, we don't engage with Him very much. But, once we need something, that's when we do all of the praying. If you look at Deuteronomy 8, 12 to 15, you read this. This is a warning about what happens in our relationship with God. We hear, when you have eaten and are full, when you have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, when all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you have forgotten your God who brought you out of Egypt and the house of bondage. That's what happens to us. We all have desires in our lives. Can you hear me back there? Can you hear me? It's okay. Yeah, we, we all have desires in our lives. And those desires involve a lot of things. So the children of Israel, when they lived in captivity in Egypt, they wanted the Lord to save them. When the Lord went to them and said, through Moses, come I will save you, they grumbled a bit at the beginning, but they followed him. But they followed him. They grumbled a bit at the beginning, but then they followed him. And they wanted to be saved from the house of bondage. Oh, wow, good service out here. And so they wanted to come out of bondage. They wanted to come out of the land of Egypt. And they thanked God for what he did. And they came out, and of course, they wanted to eat, and they asked for food, and God sent them 
manna from heaven and quails in the wilderness and they wanted to drink and God sent them water from the rock and they wanted to be guided and God sent them a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night he provided everything for them and then they reached their promised land and they entered and it says here they had eaten they were full they built beautiful houses and dwelt in them all they had was multiplied their hearts were lifted up and what happened after all of that they forgot the Lord who brought them out of the land of bondage God was a means to an end not the end in itself God wanted to save them for them because he loved them but they only wanted God to bring them out they only wanted God to give them what they wanted when we look at the apostles on the other hand they weren't like that at all the apostles were very different the apostles left everything behind and followed him they didn't forget God they forgot everything else the minute that the Lord met the fishermen at the Sea of Galilee and he said to them come and follow me what happened they left all and followed him they left all and followed him they knew that he had a greater mission for them how many of us are willing to leave all and follow the Lord and I don't mean that you leave this whole world and that you leave your studies or your work or your relationships or your families because that's something I decided to do as a monk and that's something many 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 thousands of people decide to do as monks and nuns it's a choice it's a calling but we're not all called to that life I did that as a monk Abuna did that as a priest where he left his work and he continues to serve you with his family and his life so there are there is that calling but for all of you we love to live extremes so not to have idols does not mean you have to leave everything behind there's a middle ground and the middle ground is this the middle ground is that God has a place in our lives we follow him we listen to him we desire to be with him we obey him we place him first but we continue to live in the world in that context and that's not difficult to do for you as young people in this world it's not difficult to do you just need to have the understanding of what life you want to live I'm getting lots of noise from this side and this side can someone deal with that please we need we need to understand what does God want of your life how does God want to guide you and what does he want to guide you to in Thessalonians in Thessalonians there's a very clear message to us that says this is the will of God your sanctification all God wants of us is to be holy and why does God want us to be holy because it is only in holiness that we can be close to him and therefore be with him in his kingdom forever that's what God wants us he wants us to be with him forever 
Again in Thessalonians 1, 5, 16, and 18, we read this. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So what does God want us to do? He wants us to do three things. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. And that's the most important thing. If we can live these things, then we are fulfilling the will of God. Why is it that we don't rejoice? Why aren't we happy? Of course, if we were satisfied, we'd be happy. If we felt that we were getting what we wanted, we'd be happy. So the reason is that we're not satisfied. And why aren't we satisfied? We're not satisfied because we're aiming to get one thing, we're actually getting another. So, if I were to show you this cross and say you can have this cross, and you want it. But then in actual fact, I turn around and offer you a pen. It's, you're not going to be satisfied because this is what you want. The cross is what you want. So what happens in our lives is we set ourselves targets. God says, here is this beautiful life this life of holiness, this life of sanctification, here is this beautiful life that is for you, that will help you and support you and strengthen you, that will keep you in holiness, that will guide you to a better way. Here it is, this is it. But you're thinking, well, that's nice, but I don't want that. I want this other life over here. I want, I want the material life. I want the physical, tangible life. I want the riches of this world. I want the celebrity of this world. I want the fame of this world. And so, of course, no matter how much holiness you are given, it means very little. Because it's not what we want. It's not what we desire. Those evenings, Malish. It's okay, no, that's okay, please, just, we're fine. No, no, it's okay. No, it's working, it's working. Uh, when, when, when this happens, you just leave it alone. You, you make the best because you're fighting a losing battle. If sound systems decide that they're not going to work, they're not going to work. It's now taking it personally. But it's fine. We still struggle on. I, I preach in Coptic churches, I preach in other Orthodox churches, I preach in Anglican churches, Catholic churches, Methodist churches. One thing we all have in common is our sound systems don't work. <laughs> and the minute you start, something has to happen. And you will have tested it to perfection. Um, I don't know if you, some of you will remember that during Holy Week this week, this year, we broadcast a whole evening basha from St. Mary Lebeau, from our St. Paul's service. Poor Fadi, you know Fadi Mikhail, Fadi does our sound, he's always done our sound, he's perfect. He went from 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we started recording at 6.30, he went 2 o'clock in the afternoon. People from Premier Radio went, they set up thousands of pounds worth of equipment, they tested everything, it worked to perfection. 6.25 we did a sound check. Sound check, everything worked. 6.30, we're about to record, everything failed. <laughs> everything. And it, it just didn't work again. So, like I said, when it happens like this, you just forget. It's fine. So, we need to rejoice because 
Rejoice in the good things. Rejoice in the right things. Rejoice in the things that God wants to give us. Because those are the things that are going to be important. He wants us to pray without ceasing. Why? Because rejoicing needs for us to have a relationship with God. How can we have a relationship with God if we're not praying to Him? If we're not engaging with Him? If He's a stranger? How can I enjoy any of your company? <laughs> Difficult. Anyway, no, I must enjoy your company, of course. If I don't know you, if I don't engage with you, if I don't see you, if I don't speak to you, same on this side, so there's no sexism. <laughs> But that's the thing. The more you know people, the more you engage with people, the more you get to know them personally, the more you can interact and speak. The more you can have a relationship, and therefore, the more you can rejoice in that relationship. So once you speak, then you rejoice. And of course, when you rejoice, what happens? You give thanks. And you give thanks with everything. It's incredible to think that Job said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. St. Paul who says, if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. It's incredible to think that St. Thomas, who actually, we always remember him for doubting. But we don't remember what he said before our Lord Jesus Christ went to raise Lazarus. They sent him word back, and they said to him, your friend Lazarus sleeps. He, he's dead. And so our Lord said, we're going to go back. And they said to him, listen, they sought to kill you. He said, don't worry, I have to go back. What did St. Thomas say? He said, let us go that we may die with him. They had nothing to lose. They were thankful for everything. The more bogged down we become with this world, the more we hold on to physical, tangible things, they weigh us down. They weigh us down. And the more we do that, the more our perspective is downward, not upward. The more I have things down here that are preoccupying me, and that I value, and that I worry about, and my eye is always on them. My eye is always down here to make sure my piles of money, and my possessions, and my pride, and my celebrity, and my status are all here. My eye is constantly on them, making sure that they don't go too far. If I'm doing that, I can never ever raise my perspective and look up. Never. Because I'm always down here. But the apostles looked up. Their perspective was very different. They rejoiced. They were afraid sometimes, of course. But those same fearful men at times became the ministers of the word, became the ambassadors of Christ. They became the tools, the vessels through which we today receive the word of God. Those scared men then are still being remembered and celebrated by us today over 2,000 years later. Why? Because they looked in a very different direction. They thanked God for everything. They wanted Him and they sought Him only. Quite often we push God away. He wants to give us something, we push Him away. Have, have you ever tried to be rushing out of your house? And it's not really a cold day. It's okay. And your mother's trying to chase you out of the house to give you a coat. 
right? But you get cold, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And you run out. No one's ever done that here, of course, right? What does mom know? I'm fine. Our Lord had the same experience with us. Luke 13:34. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Yet you were not willing. Yet you were not willing. God wants to gather us. He wants to protect us. He wants to give us everything. He gives us a beautiful image of a, a hen gathering her brood under her wings where it's warm, where it's safe, where they're protected. And that's what God wants to give us. He wants to give us warmth and protection. He wants to empower us and enable us to do whatever we want. He wants to give us victory. He wants to give us life. He wants to give us life. He wants to give us light. And he wants to make us light. But we insist on darkness. We insist on death. We insist on weakness. We insist on choosing the worldly, the solid, because it makes sense, because you can hold on to it. We insist on these things, and we reject the heavenly. We reject the spiritual. We reject the things that are promised from the heavens. But these are the things that are going to survive. These are the things that are going to be our protection. So we should hold on to them. But we fight against ourselves sometimes. Romans 7.15 You know, we always think of the apostles, especially St. Paul, as this incredibly powerful figure, right? St. Paul. Who here is like St. Paul? Who would be anything like him? Who would hold a candle to St. Paul? No one. But St. Paul in, in Romans 7.15 says this. He says, For what I'm doing, I don't understand. What I will to do, that I do not practice. And what I hate, that I do. I'll, I'll simplify it, it's a bit complicated. He says, I don't understand what I'm doing. There are some things I want to do, and I can't do them. And everything I don't want to do, I end up doing. Does that sound familiar? It, it's all of us. You know, you wake up in the morning, you have every intention of being a good person. You have every intention of picking up your Bible, of standing to pray, of saying good morning to God, starting your day with Him, and then as you go through your day, you smile at your parents, you smile at your brothers and sisters, you don't get angry or upset or grumpy as you're going to work or university. You go there and you meet everyone with a smile, and if anyone says something bad, you say, thank you, God bless you. You know, this is, this is what we want to do. This is the movie, the film in our heads. We've created this whole scenario. But then we end up doing the exact opposite. We end up being miserable and grumpy and demanding. We don't appreciate people around us. We meet people on the street and we are the furthest thing from the light of Christ ever. We are the furthest thing from the presence, the beautiful presence of God in the world ever. And then, if that's not bad enough, so the good things I wanted to do, I don't do. But then, what's even worse, is the bad things that I decided I'm not doing, I end up doing. You know, I'm not going to gossip, 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 I'm not going to gossip. Going to gossip. Did you hear what she did? 
And that's not just the girls, by the way, so don't laugh. <laughs> did you hear what he did? Did you hear what happened? I'm not going to gossip, I'm not going to gossip, I'm not going to gossip. Oh no, she didn't. Really? No, no. You know what? I shouldn't be telling you. Ah, but you're, you're a good friend. And I'm sure you won't tell anyone at all. Three people later, they're still not telling anyone because they're all good friends and they can all be trusted. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wish it was, that only be half the problem. You're on your laptop, you're doing work, credible work, like watching the World Cup. Well, no, I mean credible work, like you're studying and stuff. I am not going to visit those sites. No, I'm not. I'm not, not going to. I'm not going to visit those sites. No, no. I'm working. I'm working. I'm working. All of a sudden, you find yourself miraculously typing something in, hit the enter button, and you're into this virtual world again. But I said I didn't want to do it. I said I didn't want to go down that road. Why? Because our perspectives aren't clear. Our goals aren't clear. We often don't know what we want. Or even if we want it, we don't pursue it in the right way. We're not vigilant. We're not cautious. We don't watch out. You've all seen movies of knights and wars and things like that. And there's always a castle on top of a mountain with high towers. Why is that? You always build castles and fortresses on top of mountains so you can see if the enemy is approaching. You never build a castle. I, I would challenge you to ever find a castle that is built in a valley. What's the point? You can't see anyone who's coming to attack you. You're in the low ground, you leave yourself open to the high ground where people can attack you. Fortresses and castles are always built on high ground. So you can look down and see people from a distance as they approach. That's what we need to do. We need to be vigilant. We need to be looking. We need to be careful. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's why we fall. Because we have a vigilant enemy, but we are not vigilant prey. He's watching us. He's stalking us. He knows where we are, what we're doing. He knows what our weaknesses are, and he knows how he can get us. Now, that shouldn't scare us. It shouldn't scare us because having God on our side, having God in our midst, Having him as my Lord, my God, my Savior means that I am infinitely more powerful than Satan. That's why St. Paul says that I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Because he's on my side. The minute you take me alone and take God out of that equation... I'm useless. I am absolutely useless. Think about this. This this room, this hall, is completely dark. Right? And then you end up with a light bulb. Candle here. It's there. It's dark. Everything's dark. Nice, but absolutely useless. Why? There's no light in it. We are this vessel. We are this vessel. And without the light of Christ in us, we're dark. If I'm a bulb, without the power of God coming into me, then I cannot give light of myself. 
And that's why we need to stay close to him. So, how do we bring this together? It's very simple. I need to want to live a holy life. Do I? And that's one question I think you all need to answer today. Not tomorrow, not next week. Don't put it off. Today. I want you to think today. Do you want to live a life of holiness? Do you want to live a life of victory? Do you want to have power and authority over the things that challenge you and threaten you? Or are you happy to keep living as prey pursued by a roaring lion who will one day catch up with you? Do I want to live strong or am I happy to continue to live weak? Do I want to live in the fortress, in that tower, on that hill? Or am I happy to constantly live in the valley, unprotected, open to attack, and never being strong enough or protected enough to be safe? These are questions we need to answer. I can't answer them for you. You have to choose. You have to be vigilant. You have to know what you want. I can suggest, the fathers can suggest, your servants can suggest, we can guide you to the scriptures, we can lead you to wonderful um, words, we can, we can guide you to beautiful sermons and writings, but you have to choose. We sit back sometimes and we want someone to make a choice for us. We want someone to, li to, to live our life. Let me tell you this, it's essential, it is imperative that we have people guiding us. You must have someone guiding you spiritually. You must have a spiritual guide, you must have a spiritual father, you must have a confession father, you must engage with your servants, you must have this fellowship. Those are musts. We must have people advising us, but when it comes to the choice, no one will or can ever choose for you. As much as we want, as blue in the face as we become. As many times as we ask, it's not going to happen. You need to want what you want. And then, wanting it, you need to choose it. So, it's up to us. If we want to follow God, we can follow God. If we want to follow idols, as St. John tells us, we can follow idols. If we want to be empowered and be full and build beautiful homes and dwell in them and have them multiplied and give thanks to God for those things, we can. But if we want to forgive Him, forget Him and pursue the world and leave Him as a means to an end only, then that's in our gift and in our possibilities and choice as well. So, make a choice tonight. Tonight. Don't leave it till tomorrow. Make a choice tonight on what you want to do. But let me clarify this. Your choice does not become your destination. Your choice becomes the beginning of your journey. Don't think that just because you've made a choice tonight that your life is going to change instantly. Because that's what happens. We're naive sometimes. We're naive in thinking that just because I've chosen righteousness, suddenly I'm become righteous, holy. Sin will never overcome me anymore. I will always do the right thing, say the right thing, make the right choices. But that's not the case. That's not the case at all. The case is that if I make that choice today, 
then I start a new journey. I start a new journey. And that's a beautiful journey for us. But we have to then be consistent. Step by step. One at a time. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If we live this, if we remember it, if we understand it, our lives will change. And they will change beautifully. All I can do is give you this message. And I will pray for you. And I will help you and I will support you as much as I can. The fathers will do the same. But please make a choice. Allow us to help you. Allow us to empower you. And allow God to work through you that you may be transformed to this life of prayer, thanksgiving, and rejoicing in Him always. And glory be to God forever. Amen.